Thank you, everybody. And, and yes, uh, I, I think we've all been part of some aspect of training, and it it's uh, so nice to have these experts here today that have actually been implementing and working in that space. And so for today's agenda, um, we're going to have uh, Carrie Jordan is going to speak first from uh, the Carpentries. Thank you, Carrie, for joining today. And then from Michigan State University and the Cyber Ambassadors Program, um, Julie Rojeski is going to be here with uh, Astri. And I, no, I'm going to butcher your last name, Astri. Sorry about that. Um, but it's uh, but but this is the MSU folks that are here from the Cyber Ambassadors, and I see Dirk is here also. But Julie, I think you're going to be heading up the the conversation. So thank you uh, for being here today. And I guess with that, I think we should just dive right in with Carrie. You should have uh, co-host responsibilities, and then we can take a few questions when you're done with your presentation. Awesome. Thanks so much. I am sharing my screen. Can you see my slides? Okay. I'm setting a timer for myself too. This is a little tool I, I do on the side since everything is on Zoom. I set a timer for myself so I don't go past my time. So thanks again so much for inviting me um, to interact with the group today. I'm pleased to be here to share some lessons that we've learned at the Carpentries on measuring impact. And I realize that a lot of us are in the training space and it can be difficult to identify what success looks like and how to measure it. So today I'm hoping just to share some of the strategies that we use to approach assessment and measuring impact at the Carpentries and hopefully, and the way that we've sort of transitioned our approach over the years as well. I don't wanna make any assumptions about whether you know about the Carpentries. So I'm give, gonna give you a very brief overview. Um, we're a nonprofit project that trains people in software development and data science skills for more effective and career, more effective work and career development. And so we build community and local capacity for teaching and learning data skills and perspectives. I like to sum up our, what we do by just quoting our vision statement, which is to be the leading inclusive community teaching data and coding skills. So why the name Carpentry? This is a question that we get all the time. And carpentry just means the basics, like learning how to nail two boards together to put up a wall straight. Each one of our lesson programs has curricula that covers the basics of a particular topic. So for example, software carpentry workshops are for people who are learning to code and to develop software or who want to learn best practices in software development. Those lessons are domain agnostic and they teach Unix shell, uh, coding in R and Python, and then version control with Git. Data carpentry workshops are for people who work with data in their research, and they want to learn how to code and organize their projects to make their, more, their work more reproducible. And then library carpentry workshops are for people who work in library and information-related roles who want to build their software and data skills. Now, those workshops are more domain agnostic as well, although the data sets are familiar to those who are working in libraries. And so each of our workshops are two days or four half days now that they're virtual and they're interactive, offer a friendly learning environment with an enforced code of conduct. And we teach foundational skills and perspectives for learning software and data. Uh-oh, my slide isn't loading. Just give me one second. There we go. It, did, it didn't have it doesn't have all of the gorgeous pictures of our instructors. I think I made it too big. So that's why it didn't load. Oh, OK, so our instructors are the heart of our community. We have about 3000 volunteer instructors who teach workshops, host online discussions about various topics of interest from community building to organizing local meetups. They also run our global conference. And I want to take the, a moment to just shine a light on the instructors who are in this Zoom room today. So if you're a carpentry instructor, go ahead and tell us in the chat. And I thank you so much um, for volunteering with us. Trainer, see Christina and, and uh, Sarah, it's not meant to be because I definitely had your picture on this slide. Uh, trainers are individuals who lead our instructor training courses 
and they help us prepare to certify new instructors. They're very integral to the continued growth and development of the Carpentries instructor community. So if you are a trainer, if you could please let us know in the chat, and I, I definitely want to thank you so much for your service and engagement to the Carpentries. And then I have to, I always have to show our, our core team. These are the individuals who work full time for the Carpentries. And I really take pride in them because they dedicate their work to serving the community. We're a small remote team, but I believe that we're definitely making a huge impact. Our core team lives in the United States, Canada, Estonia, France, Germany, and South Africa. So those are the areas where we all live and work remotely. All right, so now that I'm done talking about the carpentry, we all kind of have a baseline, um, a little bit about more, a little more about who we are and what we do. I wanna explore how we measure impact. So this is one of my favorite quotes from a software carpentry instructor. And it reads, if someone feels it is too slow, they will be a bit bored. If they feel it is too fast, they will never come back to programming. What I'd like for us to do right now is to consider this quote and take a moment to reflect on it. Is there a relationship between the sentiment in this quote and measuring success when it comes to training. Take a moment to think about that and I would love to hear or to see your thoughts in the chat. So as it relates to this quote, is there a relationship between this quote and how we measure impact for training? What are your thoughts? So Rebecca is sharing that going too fast makes people feel excluded and that they don't belong. So success should not be measured by how quickly they get it, but how confident they feel. And I, I really appreciate that sentiment. It's not one that we often see or hear about in, in academic settings, to be honest, right? Um, because accreditation, right? We, <laughs> you know, we have to teach the thing and we have to test individuals on whether or not they learned the thing in order to get a degree or to go through a program. But I do believe that confidence plays a huge part in measuring impact. So thank you so much for that. And then Francesca is sharing that the response to the quote that success means meeting people where they are and at their experience. I absolutely love that. That speaks a lot to accessibility. Our workshops are for novice learners, but sometimes it's hard to determine whether or not you're a novice. We've had, I've, I've taught plenty of workshops where people thought they were experts and they honestly didn't know the basis. So we have to meet people where they are. And that is another way to measure success. Thank you so much. I love it. Keep typing, keep typing. Okay, I only have seven minutes, so I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> so um, I appreciate your honesty and the feedback in the chat. I had a feeling that a lot of what you shared would align with the Carpentries value. So I know that I'm in the right place. We at the Carpentries think about measuring impact in terms of short and long-term impact and the kinds of results that we wanna see coming out of our workshop. So in the short term, we want learners to walk away from a two day or a four day workshop with motivation to seek more knowledge. That's number one. Are they motivated to try again, to go to another workshop or to join a local community? Confidence that they can continue their learning, whether on their own, using some self-guided resources or with a, with a group, a local community, and also increase self-efficacy for finding ways to overcome problems if they get stuck. One of the reasons I hated programming was the debugging portion. That was the worst part. So in the long term, we want to see improvements in coding practices, of course. We want to see reproducibility. We want to see participants receiving professional recognition for the work that they're doing because of the skills that they're applying in their work, right? And ultimately, we want to see the spread of this knowledge. 
We want to see the spread of carpentry's values, and we want to see more people teaching data skills. So these are the these are the kinds of things that we measure at the carpentries when it comes to impact. Measuring impact involves consistently evaluating both short and long term outcomes, right? in order to see if there's a, and making sure that there's a shared approach, not just one person who owns all of the knowledge and who's making all of the rules about what's important in measuring impact, but a, more of a shared approach. You have many options for measuring impact. Um, you can work with an external evaluator, you can hire you know, grad students, undergrads, postdocs, um, you can hire an assessment strategist, but I truly believe that if you are working in program development or if you're working in training, it's important for you to kind of learn how to assess things on your own so that way you can tweak them as you go along. Getting started is very straightforward, but one thing that I love to stress, that I, that I have to stress whenever I talk about assessment, is to keep in mind to limit your data collection to the information that bears directly on the evaluation of your program. Sometimes we get so excited about surveys and asking questions that the questions that we ask don't actually answer the question that we want answered. And in survey development, some of us, I used to do this, I don't do it anymore. We tend to ask a lot of questions and we don't actually use the data, right? People are over surveyed. I'm over surveyed. We get surveys all the time about everything. So you want to be very intentional about the questions you ask to make sure that you're actually going to use the data. So we collect both short and long-term survey uh, data at the Carpentries on our, for our learners. We ask learners to fill out a survey right before they take a workshop and immediately after the workshop. And so these survey questions they help the instructor get an idea of their attendees' prior experience and background before the workshop starts. They also give instructors an idea of learners' current skill level and their perspectives on things like reproducibility. And then using this information, the instructors can start to plan how they'll approach the material and then what level of exercises they're likely, that are likely to be appropriate when they're teaching the workshop. And in the long term, so long term for us is six months. Um, we circulate a survey to our learners every six months. And that's really to understand the kinds of behaviors that they're adopting as a result of attending a carpentry's workshop and whether they're progressing in their career. So I put examples of both of, I took screenshots of the survey, some of the survey questions that we asked. And of course, I'll make sure that these slides are available and there are links to the surveys in the slides as well. Another way that you can measure impact is through formative assessment along the way, right? So the way I like to explain formative assessment versus summative assessment is that formative assessment is when the chef tastes the soup and summative assessment is when the guests taste it. So if I'm the chef, I'm going to taste it along the way and make adjustments so that it's perfect by the time it gets to your table. Formative assessment tells you about how well your trainees have learned the concepts while you're teaching them. And when designed well, they give specific insight into learners' misconceptions. That's a huge thing when it comes to measuring impact. What are the misconceptions? To be truly effective, you must be willing to adjust your approach along the way in response to some of the feedback that you're getting in the course or in, in the workshop um, or whatever you're measuring. And then explore how your students are learning along the way. Again, tweaking it as you go. Now, I do realize that we're not always in a position to adjust our teaching approach as we go, but that's sort of like a perfect world <laughs> if we lived in a perfect world. Another approach that we use is our sticky notes. So while teaching, we use sticky notes as minute cards to get anonymous feedback from learners. We ask learners to write one positive thing that they learned, something that worked for them in the workshop on maybe a green sticky note and then one negative thing on a, a pink sticky note. Instructors can change the prompt 
to elicit different types of feedback at the end of a break or at the end of an example or something like that. And then the instructors read through these minute cards and look for patterns and see how they can address common misconceptions or any issues that are coming up throughout the workshop. So lessons learned. I couldn't wait to get to this slide because I was really stressed in 2017. <laughs> so in April 2017, we began uh, to pilot a survey that included skills-based questions. So our goal was to include skills-based questions to determine whether learners were leaving our workshop having specific skills to work with data. So can you actually load a data set into R, right? Feedback from our community indicated that this survey gave our learners anxiety through the roof, through the roof. It was really bad. <laughs> so though, you know, we tried our best to use inclusive language in the surveys and to share with them, this is not a test. Um, you're not being, you know, you're not being, you're not taking a test. This is not an exam. However, that's my learn. I have two more slides. I'm almost done. <laughs> um, however, some of our learners felt that the questions were very intrusive and that the skills-based questions were really intimidating. And so we took a closer look at the survey and what changes should be made to make it more inclusive and to really get at the heart of what we wanted to measure. And the consensus was, we're more concerned with measuring learners' confidence and their motivation to use the tools, the motivation to use the software. And so we ended up removing all of the skills-based questions from our surveys. So why did I give you that example as a lesson learned? I ask you again, consider what's important to you when measuring impact. In some cases, you do want to know if a student has learned the skill, that's absolutely important. But in others, you're more concerned about their confidence to continue their learning. So here are my final thoughts. <laughs> um, take an inventory of your audience. What, are, what is their background? What is their motivation? What prior knowledge do they possess? What tools are they already using? What types of data do they work with? These are all questions that will help inform the way you measure impact. Earlier, I asked you to consider the quote from one of our software carpentry instructors and take a moment to reflect on it. And you shared some amazing insight in the chat. So now I'm gonna ask you again, after hearing what the Carpentries is doing, what are your thoughts on measuring impact when it comes to training? Go ahead and share some final thoughts in the chat. What are your thoughts on measuring impact when it comes to training? And while you're sharing those, I will share the last slide and I'll pass it back over. Um, I've provided some resources and I'm going to link these slides into the notes document that we have. These slides, um, I'll make them, you know, available to the whole world. Um, but the resources, the first one is our assessment repository on GitHub. It has all of the data, the source code and the analyses. If you want to check out any of our surveys, you can, everything is CC by, you can use the surveys um, if you wanna use them to you know, measure the impact of any of your trainings. I also shared our reports page. So this provides all of our assessment reports and any other report that you wanna read from the carpentry. And then I provided a link to our blog, but the, the blog, any blog post that is tagged with assessment all on one page. That way, if you're interested in, in learning more about assessment at the Carpentries, you can check out some of those blog posts. Okay, with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And I don't, I think we're gonna pass it on and save questions to the end. No, I think if there were some specific questions right now, we, we, we have a few minutes here that we could, we're about halfway through our talk, you, you would have a few minutes. I love okay. that idea of sticky notes and the minute cards to, to get at uh, issues throughout the, talk or throughout the trainings. How is that translated to online? I see comments about Jamboards. You know, this is one of the this is one of the times when I really want to call on one of our instructors oh, to okay. tell us how we transition that to online. Do we have an instructor who would like to share their experience if you've taught um, recently or taught at all in 2020 a virtual workshop and how we use 
the stickies online. Jamboard and lots of Google Forms. <laughs> <laughs> I just taught a Unix shell workshop last week. And honestly, the chat just was fine from a lot of things. Like just let and do it a lot, like a lot more often than you would for me in a in a analog classroom. But it's hard. But the students have been great. They're so flexible and awesome. Thank you. I wanted to highlight a quick question that I think Lauren brought up in the chat um, about, you know, if you're concerned about how encouraged or confident people felt, um, and what if the discouraged ones are the ones that don't fill out your survey? <laughs> what do you do about that? Do you have any thoughts, Carrie? You know, well, that's such a great point because we we often talk about that a lot. We have we review our survey results every other week as a team. And we do get survey results that, you know, maybe some, someone thought it went too fast or, you know, someone, a net promoter score less than seven and things like that. But we, we do acknowledge that the people who take the survey probably enjoyed the workshop and they wanted to, you know, they wanted to take the survey. And so that's why we, we really stress the importance of our community discussion and asking learners to come, come to you know, one of these online meetings or use one of our other communication channels to get in touch. We are often asked why we have so many ways to communicate. Um, and that really is why, because someone mentioned it earlier in the chat, meeting learners and meeting everyone where they're at. In some regions where the internet connection is, is not extremely reliable, we can't ask individuals to come to a Zoom call and take up all of that bandwidth, but maybe they can do a Slack discussion. And so we we do find that we those who have feedback that may be negative, we still get it. It may not come through the survey, but it may come via email, it may come via a Google form or some other one of our other communication channels. I have a quick question if we have time, Justin. Yeah, we can do one more. Yeah, so Carrie, the question is, so when you do the surveys, um, I know you guys do the surveys at the very beginning, but the after uh, training surveys, uh, do you do it right after the training session? And if you do a follow up, uh, do you do it? Um, so when you were talking about that, the long term also uh, of measuring the impact, do you do it like, you know, a month later? Or mm -hmm. how do you keep track of that information of, to capture that? Yes, it really does vary. We ask, we ask our instructors to save time immediately after the workshop, 10, 15 minutes for learners to take the surveys, but a lot of times they want to continue teaching more, which I understand. I've done it myself. <laughs> I try to get in one more thing. Um, and so that timing varies. Sometimes individuals take the, the post-workshop survey immediately after the workshop. Some people take it a couple of days later, but for the long-term survey, we send that out to learners every six months. So we run a report for all of the workshops that had ha that have happened within that six-month time period, and then we send the survey out to the, to individuals who have taken that workshop at least six months or longer. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Carrie, for the presentation. All right, and with that, we'll transition to uh, Julie Rojewski yes. and Astrid. And Astrid. Yeah. <laughs> so you were nice enough to give me full credit, Justin, but I promise you, you'll actually hear much uh, oh. good stuff from Astrid. She's our okay. um, really valuable teammate and she has been living and breathing our data for uh, the past year. So um, yeah, so good. So if you have lots of nuanced questions, Astrid is your girl. <laughs> All right, so Astrid's got our slides yeah, and she's going to run them for us. Share it. Thank you. And I was so glad that Carrie talked about um, some broader strokes around assessment because um, I'm going to do a quick overview of that as well. But we're going to talk mostly about our Cyber Ambassador program. Um, I'll intro a little bit about evaluation. We're going to have Dirk do one slide where he gives a really brief overview of the whole program. 
And then we're going to turn it over to Astrid to talk about the specifics of our evaluation strategy and why we did what we did, and then um, share some, some data around what we found. All right. So that's it. And so I've got a primer on evaluation in five minutes or less, and it'll be even less because okay. Carrie did such a great job um, of sort of teeing this up. And I'm going to echo some of the things that she said. So one thing to keep in mind, no matter how skilled you are as an evaluator, is focusing on the answers you want. Figure out what data you want and need so that you can ask the right questions. And there are various points of time where you should be thinking about what kinds of questions you can ask at that point in time to get the data that you need. So at the beginning of a project or um, a plan or developing your evaluation strategy, you should be focusing on your needs. That's the needs assessment phase. What are the questions we're going to ask? How are we going to ask them? How can we structure our, our program to serve the needs of our audience? And how are we going to know if those needs were satisfied? That happens before you really start anything. And very often in evaluation, this part gets um, overlooked I've, in my experience doing this work um, because we're so excited about what we have to put on offer. We kind of forget that we need to be very intentional about being strategic about what we're gonna offer so that, and designing an assessment so that we know that what we are putting on offer is valued, appreciated, and it achieves its goals. So formative assessment, this is where the chef is tasting the soup, right? This is the, the middle point of a project or an evaluation strategy so that you can gather information and data about pivoting. Is it, is it doing what we think it's going to do? Are the questions we're asking getting us the data that we need to answer the questions that we've decided are important to ask? Um, that formative middle stage is really valuable because it gives you a chance to tweak, to modify, to pivot, um, to respond in different ways. And then at the end of the project, you're doing your summative assessment, right? Did we accomplish what we said we wanted to accomplish? Have our people learned what we hope they would learn? Um, so there, you know, so that's that's the really exciting time because you're sitting on all this data and you can do all these exciting things. And that's where we are with our cyber ambassadors program. And so Austria's going to tell you about that. We went through the needs assessment early. We did our form formative assessment throughout the project, and now we're at the summative phase where we can start publishing our data. It's very exciting. So here is one strategy to think about different kinds of evaluation questions that you can ask. Um, the first kind of most basic is reaction um, information. And these are often called satisfaction surveys, right? From an evaluation perspective, these are sometimes denigrated and I think kind of unfairly because they ask really basic questions. Did, they, did participants like what they learned? Did they have a good experience? Did they find it a valuable use of their time? Um, you know, when, when, when we're to the point where we're interested in learning and impact and behavior change, it's easy to gloss over those satisfaction questions. But again, if you're focused on asking the questions to get you the information you need, sometimes those satisfaction reaction questions are really important. If you have a product that you're trying to sell or um, to implement in a new environment, before someone's going to buy it or bring it on board to their team, they're going to want to know what did people think of this. So don't overlook those reaction satisfaction questions because they can be valuable. Um, as educators, we are very, in, oh, it's Astra, you can go ahead, you can put the next animation up. Um, we are interested in learning impacts. Are people gaining new knowledge? Are they um, getting new skills? Are they, you know, picking up what we're trying to teach them, right? So those are, that's another important strategy for evaluation. Um, as these um, animations indicate, the, in, the reaction stuff is immediately after the training. Did you have a good time? Was it worth your time? Learning, um, we, for our strategy, we did a, a pre and post assessment because we were interested in what kind of knowledge, prior knowledge did they bring with them before they participated and what kind of knowledge have they gained as a result of our training. Um, and then there's also behavior change. That's the six month survey that Carrie and her team are doing. What kind of impacts are we seeing? Are they behaving differently? Are they approaching their work differently? Are they implementing, taking that learning at step two and implementing it in a way that can be used um, and that changes the way they engage with their, their tasks. And then results. This is really when it gets really exciting because you start to see that there is change happening beyond the individual level. Not just an individual is doing his or her work differently, but also they are maybe disseminating that new information. Maybe they are changing the way the organization functions. And those are more long-term strategies as Carrie described so, so beautifully. Okay. 
uh, Astrid is going to tell more about what we learned by focusing on reaction and learning. Those are our two priorities because in our needs assess assessment, we decided that that was a, a priority for us. But keep in mind, all of these questions can be valuable if you give yourself time and attention to be intentional about identifying what your priorities are and asking the right questions. Next slide. And then here's some really like basic takeaways. Um, Dirk said, everyone likes a good takeaway from a training like this. And we, we think that's so, so valuable. One, make it easy for people to participate. If you're in person, don't overlook the analog paper survey. Why? Because they're gonna have to fill it out before they leave <laughs> versus, oh, I'll do it on my phone on the way back to the airport, right? If you're online, have a URL that doesn't require a sign in. Make it easy for people to answer your surveys. I can't emphasize that enough. Surveys, again, Carrie brought this up. Ask only what you need and will use. Don't ask every question under the sun because it's just annoying. If you're not gonna use the data, don't ask for it. This is especially true of demographic data. If your priorities are not really around who's participating, what is their background? Don't force people to march through those questions if you're not gonna need it. You can have a really short evaluation and it can be very valuable. I've seen excellent evaluations that have three questions, that's it and it gives you the answers that you need to improve your product, to improve your teaching, whatever. Focus on what you need. A Likert scale, one to five is easier to parse um, than a one to 10. It may seem like you're being more generous with a one to 10, one to five is plenty adequate. Um, and use buttons so it makes it easy for people, or circles for people to answer quickly. And I always like to leave an option for qualitative feedback. Some people don't, um, have confidence in and making sense of those data, but I think they're important and it gives people a chance to reflect and share um, about their experience and their learning in ways that you would otherwise maybe struggle to find. All right, that was the quick primer. Now Dirk is going to take a minute or less to talk about the program. Okay, so Cyber Ambassadors was a program uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. It, we was modeled actually, frankly, after the software carpentries in a lot of ways. We do workshops, but these workshops, instead of focusing on technical skills, we focus on professional skills, uh, communication, teamwork, and leadership. And we've also focused on training the trainers. So we've trained dozens, well, many dozens of uh, people on how to use our materials, our training materials, and give the workshops themselves. And so there's some statistics there, and that was less than a minute. And now Astrid is going to get us into the real meat of our evaluation plan and what we found. So take it away, Astrid. All right. So I'm going to explain about uh, the detail of our program evaluation. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to talk about data collection method. As uh, Julie had just said, we collected both qualitative and quantitative, although most of most of them is more quant. Um, so we do we did both survey and observation. So in the first survey, we asked demographic reaction learning and also online modality evaluation because some of our trainings were online. And, and also, um, yeah, and, and we did uh, find out about their demographic background because our study is more like research and not only for our internal program evaluation, but we also produce uh, research studies from that. So it's much more, we're going to make a, a bit more sophisticated data analysis that we're probably going to show you later. And also in terms of observation, sometimes Julia and I also participate in the training. Uh, sometimes me as a participant or just as a passive observer. And the first of all that you need to um, a note is the participant number, like how many the actual people who are in this in the room, because it's going you're going to compare that with the number of respondent later, and also you may also want to uh, observe the venue, the logistics, like um, like is the venue really good for this type of learning? Because in in some of our cases as well, like one of our um, training that we did, uh, some people actually come some people yeah some people actually complain with the venue setting or table setting and they say that it affect their learning so you may also want to observe that but most importantly it's about instructor and the student interactions like um is there any confusion during any activities excitement or specific questions for a specific activities as well you may also want to note that so later on, after you collect the data, you can do uh, data analysis, whether it is content or if it's quantitative, it also depends on the kind of questions that you're going to ask. 
it also depends on the size of the sample that you have if it's like to uh, if it's like small you probably want to do to test and no regression um, because it requires a greater size of data so um, here is the breakdown uh, for our questionnaire we have the first two part the first part is demographic background uh, you can ask questions like basic like age gender educational level and uh, and some other uh, questions that you think is relevant to demographic or individual characteristic that may affect their learning or reactions and second also about video conferencing effectiveness because yeah as i've mentioned before we had online training with video conferencing and this is way before the pandemic uh we already uh, did that and we saw whether uh video conferencing affect um uh facilitate discussion with peers or uh that do they can really interact with instructors um and also challenges because internet connection and things like that can also affect your learning and and satisfaction and the third part, which also Julie mentioned, the, the first stage of Kirkpatrick framework is the reaction. So basically it, it, it asks you, are you satisfied? Are you happy with the training? And you can break down uh, the training into several categories. And in our cases, it is delivery and do they satisfy with the delivery method, the content and the support and overall training and delivery means like uh, whether the trainer is really competent do you think that the teaching ability is aligned with what you what you what your preference and whether the content is relevant it meets your expectation and even administration or logistical support if you want but in our case actually we didn't uh, ask that question uh, because it's already a lot and we tried to um, cut some of the questions so we're just typically embed that in the open-ended question. And if they think that logistic is something that uh, they concern about, they can just uh, write that in the open-ended question. And so this is uh, some of the example um, to that we ask to measure the teacher competency, like how well do you think the trainer responded to questions to, from the participants? And in measuring teaching ability, do you think the trainers keep the session alive and interesting? So actually like we have for each indicator we typically have one or until three questions but this is uh, we're just going to give one example here and is this relevant how satisfied are you with a certain model and um Dirk has mentioned before that we have nine modules or 10 actually so this is typically with will be it depends what kind of module they get and also, yeah, and other thing, and also this like open-ended, what did you like or find helpful and what did you not like about the training? And the way you measure that is gonna be with Likert scale. And yeah, um, this is type of Likert scale that we usually used, um, but there are a lot of type of Likert scale that is on Google, but that's that we use. Um, so um, part four, it's about the learning. Uh, we typically measure knowledge, skill, interest, and confidence. It's before and after the training. Uh, basically, you're gonna ask the same questions. The general questions you're gonna ask is, do, do, you, do they learn what you expect them to learn? And that means that the it depends on your learning objectives. Like in our case, each module, each communication model, we have several set of learning objectives. So we're just going to use that. For example, in measuring the knowledge, we have uh, how do you rate your understanding the key components of effective com communication before training? Uh, and after that, uh, how do you rate your understanding? So yeah, and again, with Likert scale, um, and for example, before that, it would be three, and after that, it would be four. So you can you can see the gap, the learning gains before and after, which you are going to analyze later. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. And pre and post test. Sometimes we do before the training and after the training, and sometimes we also uh, address both of them immediately after the training, uh, which is also common in program evaluation. Um, so we typically just say after the training, we have the set of questionnaire, just say thinking back before and after the training, how do you rate the statement below? So, um, and sometimes because 
uh, there is time constraint and everything, you probably want to use that method as well. So here are some examples of our data presentation and analysis. Uh, because uh, we have four, four parts in the questionnaire, and there are a lot of questions. Uh, around like 20 or 30 questions sometimes because it's for research purpose. And we can take look at the data from various perspectives and we can ask several questions based on the data. And this is the very basic one, like did the participants learn something? Which module has the highest learning gains? And you can, for this type of question, you can just descriptive, you use descriptive statistic in Excel and and um, uh, turn it into a graph, turn the data into a graph. Uh, for example, like this, like module A before is 3.46, and after their learning score is 4.55. And then as you see, the highest score is the module G. And then after that, as you find that uh, this, the quantitative result, you can also supplement that with your observation and also with your qualitative responses, like uh, because it can also explain why the participants like the module G better and things like that. You can combine all of the data to understand, to get more full picture about what's going on during the training. And this is the example too. You can also ask the questions like, what are the differences in participant satisfaction between across modalities, face-to-face, -face, online, and hybrid groups. What about their learning gains as well? And for this type of questions, you may want to uh, use t-test and NOVA analysis. But again, uh, this type of question require a greater sample. So if you only have five respondents, you, you probably won't uh, do this. One, you probably just ask the basic questions. And this is some examples that we have. Um, which is also what we are doing right now. Um, and then the example three, it is probably much more advanced or sophisticated. You also want to see um, correlations or relationship between variables. Like, uh, for example, if you are satisfied with the content, do you tend to learn more? Do you tend to ha have a learning, higher learning score? And if you are satisfied with the trainer performance, will you also gain more learning? And also, like to the ex the ex how to what extent your individual characteristic also affect your learning gains? And that's also something that we have been uh, doing uh, analysis and writing some research study. And you can write hypothesis. And yeah, and and again, it, it depends on of the size. It depends on the research questions that you want to ask. Uh, um, and it and then it will determine what kind of data collection and how you analyze your data. So yeah, that's that. Thank you. Thank you, Astri. Look at that. You guys did it. We're <laughs> we've, we've got eight minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, was there any specific questions for the Cyber Ambassador group? There was one in the chat I see here. Um, this sounds a lot like learning assessment for academic teaching. How if our how, if at all, is this kind of workshop assessment different? I, I was actually starting to, to type in the chat, so it's easier to address. Yeah. Um, and I'll let Astri answer independently because certainly we've had these conversations. I think one of the big differences between this and a more traditional classroom assessment um, or curriculum assessment is this, because you're absolutely right, there's a lot of similarities. Because this is one, an optional training, we needed to gather evidence of learning and impact, but also did they find it worth their time? Did they enjoy themselves? We were interested in gathering more information than might otherwise be captured about the efficacy and impact of the instructors and trainers. Why? Because for the training of the trainers portion, we wanted to be able to provide that feedback for our trainers. Like here's some useful information that can help um, shape your teaching practice. And so there, you know, the, the learning, was the core for us as it was, as it would be for a classroom assessment, but there were um, some other pieces that we needed to, um, to offer and to study as well. Great, and then the next question is, um, how does the train the trainer uh, that Dirk mentioned work? Um, I went through this program. <laughs> so um, I went through and then after the program, we, we took um, the cyber ambassador program and then tweaked that for 
other faculty and staff uh, at MSU in the research space and in the IT space and use those same modules. So uh, Dirk and team uh, taught me how to do the, to run the workshop. And then we took those and, and modified to, to fit our needs. Julie, you kind of touched on this, but sure. um, there's, there've been questions in the chat about the perennial problem of how to get people to reply to your surveys. Yeah. Yeah. And you touched on some tips, but I don't know if you want to, you or yeah. us to expand on that. Yeah. So like you can write, I mean, there are dissertations who have been written on this very thing, right? So there's, you know, there's a certain psychology to it. Um, I think we had the benefit of, um, being able to illustrate that this is part of an NSF funded research intensive environment. And so we really not only wanted the feedback, but we're able to articulate and demonstrate that this, the surveys were going to be used in these kinds of ways. It wasn't just, here's a survey, we may or may not look at the data. No, this is, here. This here's a survey, there, there's a reason we're asking these questions and here's how we intend to use it for both research and programmatic improvement. Um, reasons. And, you know, I think this is probably true for all of the, the trainings that we offer. We're, we're offering them to smart and engaged people. And so helping them understand the big picture of their participation can be really motivating. Um, you know, as far as the questions about, you know, getting the people who are disengaged, not participating, I think this is where the observational component that we were able to build in helps because we were able to see when people were clearly like, you know, shuffling the paper or outside or didn't even bother to log into the, to the thing. And so if we were able to know who those people were, we could follow up and say, hey, I saw you didn't participate in the survey, that's fine. Is there any reason or like, what should I know? You know, if you have the capacity to do that, that can be really valuable. Um, yes, so those are just a couple off the top of my head. That could be a separate hour. How's that? Yeah. I'll come back for that. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Jenna, you want to take it away? Sure. Um, so thanks everybody for coming to the call. I realize now that since I usually close the call, I'm like the Pavlovian signal to just hit the leave button. Don't worry, I don't take it personally, but I do have some things to tell you. Uh, if you haven't signed in, please do so now. The link is in the chat. Uh, just a reminder that this call was recorded and we will have that up soon. You'll get an email. Uh, today's topic was measuring the impact of training. Special thanks to our presenters. Uh, Carrie L. Jordan, the executive Directory of, director of the Carpentries, and Julie Rojowski and Astri Brillianti of Michigan State and the Cyber Ambassadors Program. Our next call is gonna be on May 13. So I dropped a link for this in the chat as well. Next week is NVIDIA's GPU Technology Conference. So for those of you who are in the space of supporting GPUs, you might wanna check that out, it's free. And there are training sessions around AI and machine learning that might be helpful, I'm not sure, but I thought I'd let you know. Also a reminder that PERC 21 deadlines are coming up. They are hard deadlines. The short paper submissions are due on April 13th. Uh, the panels in Birds of a Feather, May 9th, and posters are May 16th. And you can just go to perk.acm.org slash PERC 21 for that. So a uh, special thanks to the people who worked on this call and a welcome to Justin and Gladys. I'm glad to have you on board and helping out. Uh, thanks to the rest of the team, which is Christina, Weirwan, Martin, Annalie, Amy, Katya, Bob, and I am Gianna. Hope you guys have a great day. <laughs>